Welcome to our first Finding Direction Speaker Series event. To kick things off, we spoke to Dr. John Picari about his professional journey as an exercise physiologist. A big thank you to the Western Colorado University School of Graduate Studies for funding this speaker series and additional support from the High Altitude Exercise Physiology Program. Dr. Picari or John Picari is uh, just retired, actually. I hate retirement. <laughs> um, so he's he uh, was the in the clinical exercise physiology program at the University of Wisconsin La Crosse for 25, 28 years. Um, always, if an undergrad student came to me and said they wanted to go to a grad program in clinical exercise phys or cardiac rehab, it was like. That's the top school, and there's top two or three schools. Uh, that's where John was at. They had an adult fitness program there, cardiac rehab program there. Um, those of you here that have done Wellness Elevated, it was probably one of the original you know, versions of Wellness Elevated. And you know, John's, for me, been a really good mentor, um, good friend for a solid decade, and just and, and, and the, that mentorship really gets into the purpose of his talk. And uh, while Maggie said you can ask questions at the end, the purpose of his talk, uh, as well as afterwards, and, and this is something I've wanted to do more of as kind of an informal but formal part of your education as graduate students, is you, you, you all end up being really smart, right? You're, you're all probably smarter than me, all right? My, my wife would nod her head and say, absolutely, you're smarter, right? Um, and you, know, you, get, you get these skills, but, but as you get into your career, you're gonna find you have an opportunity to apply your skills in all these areas that we don't really prepare you for. People are gonna say, oh, you know about high altitude exercise physiology? hey, can you put a blog together for our company, for people that are coming up here to visit? All right. Or you might just be invited to speak at a small engagement or a large engagement. Um, a company might want you to work with them. All, all these things that we don't really, I think, prepare you for, I've been invited to do. And a lot of times I didn't have an answer to what, what I should do. And, and I always, you know, the last decade, I've, I've turned, turned to, to John. And so I found these opportunities myself really rewarding. Some of you are working with me on a sponsored research or have worked with a sponsored research. And I end up, I make a lot of money doing that. I have people that they want to know, even though I'm not very smart, they want to know what I think. And I say, if you want to know what I think, pay me. And you need to know that. You need to, know that. You just need to start learning about that. Um, and, and it's not just about some of it's how much is I'm worth, but some of it, it just creates these amazing opportunities that you're going to have. And that's what I think is really cool about our graduate program that that Dr. Buchanan, you know, has has developed is, is all these opportunities that will it'll eventually lead you to. And, and so the purpose of tonight is is just to have John share some of his experience of how he's navigated these things and some of the opportunities that, but it's also an opportunity for you to ask a lot of questions. Right? And so at any point during his talk, you know, don't feel like he's going to talk for 50 minutes and then you ask questions. Maybe you can ask questions afterwards. But if there's something you have a question about, you know, fire away right away. So that's that's hopefully setting the stage for what he's going to talk about and the whole the, the purpose of it for you. So so enjoy and, and welcome and thanks for coming, John. I'm not sure what I'm going to talk about, Lance. <laughs> for the record, I've, I was at UWL for 32 years. I just retired June 1st, and I love retirement. It's nice not to have to prepare lectures, great exams, read theses, et cetera, et cetera. Um, 
this is you know, the picture of UWL, obviously. Um, somebody was asking, if, if sometimes you take things for granted. Because people are like, what are all those initials? Just, most of them just mean I'm old and I've been around a while. Uh, RCEP is a registered clinical exercise physiologist. It's a certification you get. Um, FACSM is a fellow of the American College of Sports Medicine. Uh, all that means is after you've been in an organization and done a certain amount of research, you've been on a certain number of committees or things like that, you can apply for fellowship status. Then that allows you to move up in the organization and be on the board of directors and those type of things. Um, MAACVPR, uh, AACVPR is the National Cardiac Rehab Association. Um, after you've been a fellow for 20 years, you be, they give you um, master fellowship status. It just means I've been around a while. Um, um, in many ways, Lance and I's careers have kind of paralleled each other. And uh, it's, it's kind of interesting because, uh, as you know, Lance is kind of a fashion icon. You know? He said, we were at a meeting, we were at an ACE American, call, uh, American Council and Exercise meeting, and he's showing me this picture. And I said, you know, Lance, you think you were the first. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> it's the only outfit I have. And the students say, do you have any clothes that don't have lacrosse exercise and health program on them? Eh, not many. But the funniest one, I think, was this one here. <laughs> Some of the students dressed up like me for Halloween, right? And, well, you guys know Anthony Davis? Anthony Davis plays in the NBA, has a unibrow. I used to have a unibrow. So this was, when I was a student at UWL, the students took a picture of this, and you notice this girl has a unibrow, but then I got married and my wife made me get rid of the unibrow. <laughs> but the funny thing about this was they, they dressed up like me for Halloween. And they bought khaki pants at Gander Mountain. But they didn't take the tags off. So after Halloween, they took them back. They're like, you're good for a joke, but for 35 bucks, we're taking the pants back. Right? Now, Lance and I's careers have paralleled, but I don't think Lance has appeared in Playboy or Penthouse Magazine. I've been quoted in the Wall Street Journal, I've been quoted the Wall Street Journal, Time Magazine, USA Today, Wall Street Journal, on and on and on. But well, just with some of the research we do, we, we do practical research like you, know, you guys do here and stuff like that. So we had done a study on walking poles, which I'll mention in just a bit. So my daughter was in the eighth grade, and we go to a, she played volleyball. Not very well, but she was on the volleyball team. So I go to the eighth grade volleyball match, and one of the fathers says, hey, I saw you in Penthouse Magazine. You quoted in Penthouse Magazine last month. <laughs> I guess they have a men's health column in Penthouse Magazine. So they tell me. So I'm like, oh, that's nice. So I go to the next volleyball match about a week later. And what does he bring in a brown paper bag? Penthouse magazine. <laughs> My wife is, what's that? Well, nothing, honey, nothing. <laughs> nothing. Anyway, um, this is what we're going to talk about. Because, again, you never know where life is going to take you. You never know what opportunities are going to present themselves. So I'm just talking from experience here. And some of the things that I've learned over the years, both from an education point of view, we'll talk about how do you work with different companies? How do you get your foot in the door? How do you perpetuate those relationships? Um, talk about consulting. How do, what do you charge? How do you charge? Some things to take into account. Um, how do you market yourself? You guys probably know more about that than I do because Lance, you just got a cell phone how many years ago? Because I know for a while I couldn't call Lance. I had to call his wife's phone to get a hold of Lance. The only good thing that came out of COVID is I got rid of my flip phone, right? Last April, my flip phone took a swim, so I had to get an iPhone. So you guys know more about probably marketing and social media than I do. And then um, the importance of being involved in professional societies, such as the American College of Sports Medicine, American Council on Exercise. So I'm just going to tell you my journey um, educationally, because you never know where you're going to end up. I mean, I started out, I was supposed to go to the University of Massachusetts. Um, Back then, you know, Lance and I were talking, I came from a small town in Massachusetts. Um, back in the day, I was fast, I was a decent football player, and I was supposed to play football at a Division II school. Come to find out, my, my uh, spring of my senior year in high school, I developed a bone tumor. 
which I dealt with for five years. So I never ended up going to UMass, okay? Um, so I ended up going to a community college. But when I was going to go to UMass, I was going to be a wildlife biologist. We had a friend who was a game warden, you know, like a DNR game warden, you know, a game, fishing game. So we had a family friend who was a game warden. I'm like, that's pretty cool. I want to be a game warden. So, but I didn't end up going to UMass at first, so I ended up going to a community college just to fill up time and while I had surgeries and all that kind of stuff. Well, during that time, I, I coached during the summer with a friend, coached baseball with a friend of mine who was, a, who was an athletic trainer for the New England Patriots. I'm like, that's really cool. I'd rather be an athletic trainer, right? So I transferred in three years to Springfield College in Massachusetts and tried to get into, spring, into the athletic training program. I didn't get in. Now I'm in trouble, right? So I ended up taking physical education and, and um, corporate fitness, right? So I was kind of on an oddball schedule, only because I was there, I had an extra semester. So I ended up taking a course in cardiac rehabilitation from someone who had come from the University of Wisconsin La Crosse. And back then we had a master's program in, it was called Adult Fitness Cardiac Rehab. And I'm like, wow, that's pretty cool. I've always had a fascination with the heart. And I'm like, you know, down deep, I'd always wanted to be a cardiologist. But I'm like, I don't want to go to school for 12 years to be a cardiologist. Well, I ended up going 13. <laughs> and I didn't make about a quarter, not even a quarter as much as a cardiologist. But it was just kind of happenstance that I ended up in cardiac rehab. So when I was at UW La Crosse getting my master's in, you know, it was called adult fitness cardiac rehab back then. Now it's called clinical exercise physiology. One of my mentors, Phil Wilson, who started the program, consulted to a cruise line. So I went and worked on a cruise ship for Norwegian Cruise Lines for two years. And then once my liver gave out, because we had an unlimited bar tab, <laughs> he's like, I'm not going to let you, seriously, I'm not going to let you work anymore. You need to get off and go for a PhD. So then I went to the University of Massachusetts, finally, and got my uh, PhD in exercise science with a specialty in clinical exercise physiology. So it's interesting how you never know where, th where things are going to take you. And things don't have to be static. They could be changing, right? Um, after that, I went and did a postdoctoral fellowship for two years at UMass Medical Center. Like, you guys are all fitness majors. You've heard of the Rockport one-mile walk test, okay? My friend and I, Greg Klein and I, did that as our postdoctoral fellowship. We tested, we developed the, the Rockport one-mile walk test. And you know that when you do a publication, someone has to be first author. And then, so we're like, geez, we both, we tested 373 people. Who's going to be first author? Crap, I lost. <laughs> so Greg Klein, if you look at the scientific, right, citation, Greg Klein is number one and I'm X, I'm second. <laughs> what do you do? Sometimes stuff happens, okay? Um, so. Let's go on from there. So again, you, you never know what opportunities are going to present themselves. Sometimes you start out in one direction, circumstances turn you in a different direction, right? The one thing that all these places had in common, Springfield College, UMass, UW, WL, you had, good, you had good people we were working with. We went to you know, outstanding schools. Springfield's the best PE school in the country. UWL, the best clinical exercise physiology. UMass, I worked with Patty Friedson. It's like working with Lance. If you do end up, how many people plan on going Furthering their, furthering their education, they might, right? So as you, as you choose a school, figure out what they're doing, you know, what they're doing for research. Who's going to be there? Are you going to see them on campus? You don't, want, you don't want to go someplace where your major professor is off traveling around the world, giving talks and stuff like that. Are they going to be able to open doors for you? Are they going to be able to get you jobs? Like Lance, like Lance said, if one of you guys wants to go into, into clinical exercise physiology, He's going to call me, and you're going to get into UWL, right? So you, you work with people who are going to provide you with opportunities and open doors for you as you, you, know, as you choose your school. Oh, what else we got here? Research. Um, conservatively, we've done probably, I've been involved in probably 450 to 500 research projects in my career. Because we have you know, 15 students every year at UWL. We do another three or four of the five studies every year. So we've been involved in a lot of that stuff. So as you get involved in research, you've got bench research, which is mainly figuring out mechanisms and dealing with rats and test tubes and stuff like that. That's not what I like to do. Some of you guys might like to do that, right? 
Um, I tend to lean toward the practical applied stuff, testing exercise equipment, training regimens, stuff like that, which is, it really has a lot of practical application for our students. They, they love that stuff. They enjoy doing it. Um, but then you say, where do you, where do you get your ideas? How do you come up with ideas to do research, right? You're all, you know, we're always reading newspapers. You're looking at infomercials and seeing new products on the market. You go to the American College of Sports Medicine meeting. You go to the cardiac rehab meeting. You always have your antenna up. The hardest thing as a professor is we had 15 grad students every year. That means we get to come up with 15 research projects, ideas every single year. That's not probably the hardest part of my job and probably the hardest part of yours is finding thesis projects or research projects for all of our under, undergraduate and graduate students. Okay, so you've always got your antenna up. Depending what your interests are, you, know, you see product advertised on some, some infomercial. Hmm. I could do a study on that, you know. Um, now we're, you know, after a certain point, you, you, you develop a certain reputation. Now people come to us. People come to Lance. They say, hey, we got this product. Can you test it? You know, so, but that takes, it took me a decade to do that. It take, took him 15, you know, 10 to 15 years, the same thing. So um, you're, always, you're always racking your brain trying to come up with ideas. People say, oh, oh. the first study we ever did, Study on walking poles. This guy was a marathon runner, and he developed walking poles. The whole idea was that this is Tom Rutland. He was a marathon runner, hurt his Achilles tendon, couldn't run anymore, so wanted to get a good workout. Well, cross-country skiing is considered to be one of the best aerobic workouts, so he developed extra striders, right? So I'd heard him speak, and I'm like, uh, can you get us some of those poles? We'd like to do a research project on your polls. So he sent us some polls, and that was the first study I ever did that got published. Actually, one of my students did it as a thesis, and then we got that study published. And then it's kind of really strange because you've heard of, you guys know Cedric Bryant from the American Council on Exercise? All of the work that Lance does with American Council on Exercise, Cedric Bryant is the chief, finan uh, the chief science officer for ACE. So, as a starting professor, you want to get your name out there, right? So Cedric wrote a, a column every, every uh, month for Parade Magazine, comes in the Sunday newspaper. It's a little fitness column. So he reported on this study, and it said, you know, geez, a university study showed that walking poles increased caloric expenditure by 10 to 25 percent and heart rate by 10 beats per minute. He didn't mention my name. He didn't mention University of Wisconsin the Cross. That pissed me off. Pardon me. So I call, I call Cedric. I said, Cedric, throw me a bone here. Right? I said, you know, gee, you could have at least mentioned it. I was the lead author on that study. It was done at the University of Wisconsin the Cross. My administrators to see that, they're going to love that. So I think he must have felt sorry for me. Because about six months later, you know, he got a hold of me to do some studies for the American Council on Exercise. Right? And we've done, I think, 75 studies for ACE over the last you know, 23, 24 years. Right? But it's interesting how that happened. But had I not contacted ACE and been proactive, I never would. Hey. So you've got you to get out there. You've got to be proactive and, and market yourself. People say, What's, what are some of the best studies, you've, favorite studies you've ever done? Can you believe someone paid me to study buttocks, what's the best butt exercise, right? So we had people do a bunch of, a bunch of different uh, buttocks exercises, we put EMG electrodes on, right? People, people paid me to study that. My, that. That's probably not my favorite. This is probably my favorite. They paid us to study sports bras. So I got a call from eight. So I got a call from somebody at 4 o'clock on a Friday afternoon. So if you get a call at 4 o'clock on a Friday afternoon, somebody says, we want you to study sports bras, right? Do you think it's real or is it a joke? So I get the phone, off the phone, I look up and down the hall, I'm like, who's pulling my leg here? I got one guy in particular, I'm like, who's pulling my leg? So we actually did a study looking at what's the best sports bra back in the day. And you say, where, do, where does an idea like that even come from? I mean, who would even think to study sports bras? You probably don't even recognize. Money you don't even probably recognize. You know who that is? Who is that? Um, I, I don't know. Mia Hamm? Mia Hamm? That's her close sister, Brandy Chastain. No, this was from the 1999 
a FEMA World Cup with this Brady Chastain kicked in the winning penalty kick to win the cup, World Cup for the United States. And then she was so excited, she ripped off her shirt and she's there in her sports bra. So people are like, wow, what is the best sports? People are going to, if, if women are going to exercise, what's the best sports bra? Do you know what the first sports bra was? I mean, sports bras, I mean, my, this, this was, the, this is the truth. This was in, this was in Sports Illustrated. They had, a, they had a history on sports bras. And the first thing that large-breasted women wore, they sewed together two jock straps. Right? My sister, God rest her, my sister is 44D. My sister is 44D. She used to wear, no, 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 lie. She used to wear, I mean, she was, she was into athletics in, in high school, but she used to wear two bras, right? I mean, just this is the problem people are facing, right? Do you know what all of our research, you know what the best sports bra came out to be? Because we tested Dan Skin, Champion, and I forget the rest of them, it's too long ago. You know what the best one was? Jenna bra. <laughs> <laughs> but again, you just see, you say, where did that idea come from? The idea came from someone seeing Brandy Chastain rip her shirt off, and then it's like, wow, these women wear sports bras. What's the best one to wear? And so we looked at, you know, we looked at fit, we looked at actual vertical displacement of the breast. First thing we did is hire two women to keep me out of jail and supervise all the testing. But again, just shows you where it's kind of a, where that idea even come from, right? It came from that. Um, so, the other thing is companies come to us and you say, why do they even bother to come to you? Why might someone contact you to do a study on their product? They want to sell more product, right? So whenever I work with a company, we always say, first thing I ask them, what kind of, you know, da, 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 what kind of claims do you want to make? What do you want to say about your product? And then, I usually will have them send me a piece of equipment because I don't want to take their money if I can't help them. They're going to say, did you pay $20,000 and you didn't come up with the results I want? Well, hey, tough. So I always have them send us a product, right? And then we, we try to give, we, so we pilot test it and try to go up. I try to give them a realistic idea is, can we, do, can we substantiate the claims you want to make? Is there a reasonable expectation if we pilot test this that it's worth you spending X number of money with us, okay? And if, if, if someone, wants to make, I'll give you an example, two examples, but the first one, I had a conversation just before I retired. You ever seen those little, those little sets of pedals, you sit on the couch and you pedal like this, right? Company, they want, they want us to do a study on that. So this guy sends me a report that someone else had done a study on these little pedal bikes, right? I look at the data, you know how much heart rate went up on pedaling one of those things? How much do you think heart rate went up? So you're sitting on your couch, pedaling a little thing, and you get about a four inch range of motion. You're absolutely right. Heart rate went up two beats per minute. <laughs> Caloric expenditure went up 0.3 kcals per minute. It's about a quarter of a, a potato chip while you're sitting on the couch watching the Packer game, right? So I asked the guy, I'm like, what? What kind of resistance does this thing have? It's electric. It doesn't even have any resistance. So I'm like, you're wasting your time. I'm not going to waste your time even to do a study to try to measure heart rate going up two beats per minute and go up 0.3 kcals per minute, right? This is one, you guys have seen Shark, or heard of Shark Tank? You know Lori Grenier? Lori Grenier is the blonde hand gal, right? So someone comes on Shark Tank selling this Simply Fit board. Have you ever seen these things? Right? This, is, this is a Simply Fit board. So I get a call from Lori Grenier's secretary, not secretary, like manager, right? And they want me to do it, they want us to do a study on the Simply Fit board. They say, what do you want to do? Oh, we want to say that strength strengthens the abs, strengthens your buttocks, and A, B, C, D. So I said, send me a board. Send me a, so they sent us two. So you get on there and you shake like this. I didn't even bother to put EMG electrodes on to see 
Are you going to burn? Or to, are you going to increase mustard? You, you're going to get yourself in trouble. So she said, "Send me a proposal." I sent her a proposal, and she didn't like the proposal. Okay. So it wasn't robust enough, she said, meaning it wasn't going to back up her claims. So this is one of the only studies where we submitted a proposal. They came back and said, thanks, but no thanks. Because we couldn't substantiate the claims they wanted to make. Because you're putting your neck on the line. If, if Lance and I say something, I mean, people, his, his name sells product. My name sells product. Companies want to use our name. They want to, but it's our reputation that's on the line. If we go up and say, hey, that's the greatest thing since sliced bread, and you're going to tone your hips, you're going to tone your buttocks, you're going to tone your abs, people think we're endorsing that, OK? And it's our butt on the line. It really, when you're in, a, in professional organizations and leadership positions like we are, it makes you look bad. It makes you look like a fool if, you, if they make claims that aren't realistic. And, and you open yourself up for, for lawsuits. Um, question becomes, what do you, if you enter into a relationship with a company, right? what do you charge? How do you figure it out? I've charged anywhere from zero all the way up to the most expensive study we ever did was $60,000, okay? If I need, if, you know, because you a lot of small, a lot of startup companies. Hey, someone developed a product in their basement. They want to do a, they want you to do a study on it. They want to make some marketing claims. They don't have any money. So if I need a thesis bad enough, I'll say, you know, I've got a student who needs a thesis project. Send me the, send me the product. We'll test it and, and you know, Try to tr and evaluate your claims. We've also charged as much as sixty thousand dollars for a study. Big study we did for Nordic Track back in the day. We charged sixty thousand bucks. So it runs in between. People say, "How do you determine what to charge?" You know, usually times they'll go, "You know, how many subjects? How much testing you're going to do? How much effort is going to be in that study?" The other thing is kind of like, "How much do I think they can afford to pay?" You know, some of these companies have a boatload of money, and they're going to make a boatload of money off of us. Small startup company, usually pretty lenient. Okay? Bigger companies, they got a lot of money, they're going to make a lot of money, going to sell a lot of product, go for whatever you can get, in all honesty. Another thing you have to, to figure when you do this is who owns the data. Right? As a professor, or as an assistant professor, or a young professor especially, you need to publish papers. Right? I mean, you need to get peer-reviewed publications out there. If a company, you know, so they pay you to do a study. In the contract, you can either say that the company owns the data, meaning you do the study, you write up a report, you send it to them. You can't publish that without the written permission from the company. So if I do a study and it comes out positive, they're probably going to say, hey, hell yeah, heck yeah, publish that. But if it comes out negative, they're not going to want to publish it. They're going to squash it. So if I'm a young professor and I need to get stuff published, I just wasted my time. Right? See what I'm saying? If they own the data. And I always put in there. So if a company is smart, they'll put that in there. When I send them a contract initially, I don't put that in there. Right? Because I want to publish. I want, I want to get the true message out to the public. Right? But also in there it says, they can't use my name, any of my researchers' names, or the University of Wisconsin Lacrosse in the advertising of any of that, you know, without permission from the university. I have to get permission from the chancellor, right? So it's two ways, something to, something to consider. Have I done studies where the company owns the data and I can't publish it? Hell yeah. Depends how much of a mercenary you want to be. You know, if I've got somebody in my lab, that I need to, that I need to, or want to pay during the summer. I haven't got the money. I said, yeah, well, it's a, you know, it's not my ideal way of doing it. I don't need any more publications. I said, who introduced me, Maggie? Somebody said, my buddy Carl has 500 peer-reviewed publications. I have 300. Do I need any more? Hell no. So you know what I'm saying? So sometimes I'll do a study where the company owns the data. I don't care. I can make some money. I don't. I don't make. I get it to. I, I can pay my research assistant. You see the balance. It's kind of like, it, it's, it's. It's. You're always playing that game. You're always playing. As a young professor, I don't think I'd do a study unless I had the opportunity to publish it. Depending, regardless of the result, positive or negative. Okay. What else we got here? Consulting. 
um, again, you can consult to, for private industry, meaning you know, doing equipment research. Uh, we do a lot of studies in the American Council on Exercise, but you know, private companies are always trying. They, but before they can market their product, they, they need the Federal Trade Commission means you have to have data in the can. You have to have documented proof. If I say, you know, lifting, lifting that thing there increases muscle strength, I've got to have a study that shows that people that lifted that thing 100 times, whatever, increased their muscular strength, right? Also that, and again, you're not going to get this early on in your career where you're an expert witness on a court case. I mean, Lance and I are at the point now where we do some of that. So I did some of that stuff. I've probably done four or five. He's, he's done one. And when companies make claims, you've got lawyers out there who are trolling all these products and say, are the claims they make, are they, are they true and valid claims? Right? And then on the other side, you get injury lawsuits. Um, you've heard of you know, Skechers, what are those things? Skechers shape ups. You know those Skechers are rocker sole shoes? Right? There were more injuries wearing those rocker sole shoes. And again, people report injuries to consumer, report, uh, consumer reports or consumer, um, yeah. They had more complaints on those rocker sole shoes, more injuries on those rocker sole shoes than any other product in history. Okay? So again, they then hire people like us to try to either work with the Federal Trade Commission to go after the company. Or well, the company's going to hire people to try to defend them and say, hey, people wear these shoes, they don't get hurt. Right? That's what an expert witness does. I'm going to show you a couple things of false advertising. Now, you've seen these, you've seen these bracelets, these, these energy bracelets. Anybody wear one of these? I just wear it as a joke because it made me a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> but you've seen, these, you've seen these things with... <laughs> About a $30,000 bracelet right there. <laughs> but you've seen these you know, energy bracelets, these neck, fighting necklaces, all these things, right? Do they work? I will show you. We'll watch. So, power balance. I'll give you a little preference. Power balance was one of the first ones that come out, and you'll, you'll see. We had proposed a study to, to look to see, you know, they're making all these claims increase of strength, increase balance, increase flexibility, right? But, like, that's a bunch of hooey. There's no. It's got, a, it's got a charged, it's got a piece of cellophane in it. It's got a piece of saran wrap, right? How the heck, how is that going to make you run faster, jump higher? It's ionized. Oh, yeah. So we get a call. We, we'd propose to do a study. I get a call from ESPN outside the lines. You heard ESPN? They, they do like investigative reports. They say, hey, we, we heard you're doing a study on these, power, these bracelets. Can we come up and film your research? So I'm going to show you like a, about a five-minute clip where ESPN actually came to our university and filmed this. And I'll show you the end result. I don't really do a lot of testimonials, but this works. My name is Shaquille O'Neal, and I'm one of the Power Balance generals. On the Power Balance website, Shaquille O'Neal claims the company's bracelet provides balance, flexibility, and strength. He's being paid by the company to recruit an army of believers. But I'm, I'm here to tell you that it works. It works. Power balance is popular with everyone from celebrities like Robert De Niro, Joe Jonas, and David Beckham, to NBA stars like Lakers forward Lamar Odom, who is paid to endorse and market the bracelet. Odom's not only endorsing it, he's a client. What's the most important reason that that's on your wrist? Um, other than marketing and branded? <laughs> nah, I mean, I think it helps. In September, at the FIBA World Championships, several of Odom's teammates also wore the bands in practice, including Derek Rose, who is also paid by Power Balance, and Kevin Durant, who isn't. Everybody on our team has them, I think, here. Um, you know, uh, they, they probably wear it for the same reasons I wear it for a fashion statement. <laughs> so do you feel any different with it than you ever did before? No, nah, I feel the same. I feel the same. Uh, maybe they work for some people, maybe they don't work for some people. So, you know, but uh, they're, they're, pretty, they're pretty cool to look at. The company says the bracelets, which retail for about $30, use a Mylar hologram 
and are designed to optimize your body's natural energy flow. 26-year-old Josh Rodarmel and his 36-year-old brother Troy co-founded Power Balance three years ago. Sales that year, a modest $8,000. By this June, sales had skyrocketed to $17 million, and the company projects more than $35 million in sales this year alone. According to Power Balance, it is yet to conduct scientific tests to validate that its bracelets actually improve athletic performance. And the company's co-founders declined outside the lines request for an on-camera interview. Outside the lines went to the University of Wisconsin at La Crosse, where exercise physiologists were studying the Power Balance bracelet for the American Council on Exercise, a consumer watchdog. Dr. John Porcari and his staff tested 12 men and 9 women, 20 of them UWL athletes, to determine if the Power Balance bracelet provides more athletic benefits than a rubber placebo bracelet that costs roughly 30 cents. Good job. Each subject performed four tests, similar to those used in demonstrations on the Power Balance website. The bracelets were covered with a shroud so that neither the subjects nor the examiners knew which bracelet was being worn during each test. Okay, we're good. Based on what we saw, doesn't seem to work. Dr. Porcari's data indicates the Power Balance bracelet offers no performance benefit when compared to the 30 cent placebo bracelet. No, no improvement in flexibility, no difference in balance, strength or vertical gel. Absolutely no difference. When we told Power Balance about the results of the UWL study, the company issued a response which read in part, Power Balance has lived and thrived in the ultimate testing environment, the real world. Okay, go ahead and rotate as far as you can. All the subjects wore both bracelets, but despite the order in which they were worn, whichever bracelet was worn second consistently produced higher test results. <laughs> Probably, suggests poor Carey, because the subject was warmed up 147 or ready for the examiner to exert force. He calls that the order effect. People did statistically significantly better on the second trial. Regardless of what bracelet they were using? Regardless what bracelet they were using. Whenever Power Balance demonstrates its product, the first test is always done without the band, and the second test with it. Did you feel better every time you put the second band on than the first? Yes, yes, definitely. And after I did like the test, for some reason I just felt, I don't know, like I could perform better. Sophomore Brittany Walensky was then told that the second band she wore in each test was not the Power Balance product, but rather the 30 cent bracelet. Really? Oh, wow. When you look at the scientific validity of, of does the Power Balance bracelet work? No, it doesn't. Placebo effect works, but does the Power Balance bracelet work? You know, based on our pilot study of 21 subjects, we'd conclude no. So what does that tell you? Tell you it doesn't work. <laughs> Tell you it's just an, to me, it's just an absolute scam. But for athletes like Tyson Chandler, who have had success wearing the bracelet, it's not about science, it's about faith. It works for me, so I, it's, it's worked when I used it, so I don't know if it's psychological now or, or what it is. There probably is something good about it, but the main thing is if you think it is good for you, then, then it's probably good for you. So again, when you talk about doing research, conducting research, that's why you spend so much time on, on conducting studies objectively in an unbiased fashion, right? How much do you think that cost, how much do you think our study cost power balance? A whole lot, like 57 million, a whole lot. That's why when you see me like looking after my shoulder, looking over my shoulder, look at that. They had to pay 57 million dollars based on that research project we did. You know those Skechers shape-ups I talked about? They're supposed to, you know, you know those Skechers shape-ups, they create instability, kind of like walking in sand. The whole idea is that, geez, if I'm unstable, right, I'm going to burn more calories, I'm going to use more muscles, going to tone my butt, my ab, and everything, right? Yep, study we did, caught, Reebok had some, 25 million bucks, Skechers got found, fined 40 million bucks, New Balance, had, they don't have a very big market share. So again, that's why you see me looking over my shoulder and waiting for these lawyers, hitmen, to come after me. 
We also put, we did another study on abdominal stimulation belts. Uh, ab Energizer, Ab Works, and Fast Abs, we put them out of business. They just closed down. They closed down shop. Because, again, the Federal Trade Commission, you know, we get this study published, right? We get these studies published. Federal Trade Commission looks at that. They go to the company and say, show me the data where this stuff works. It doesn't work. They don't have the data. Okay. So, you talk about private consulting. You talk about private consulting. Like when I, when I do expert witness consulting, or, or if a company calls me, if a company calls me, I'll talk to them for a while. But when they start picking my brain about research, design, and designing a product or a strategy, then they, I'm going to make them pay. So you say, what is, how much is your time worth? Right? I mean, if you were to go out and consult, I mean, do you people do, how many people do personal training? Anybody? What do you get? A couple, couple hundred bucks an hour? No. How much do you charge per hour? Not per hour. Oh. You gotta learn to make something up. But, but you figure out, you guys are gonna have, some of you are undergrads, some are master's degree. You gotta have a master's degree. You gotta have a lot, you got a lot of stuff up here. You put a lot of money into your education, right? Just for perspective. We got my bike fixed the other day. They charged 78 bucks an hour to fix my bicycle. My car repair, just had an alternator put in, 92 bucks an hour. I had my outboard motor fixed. They charge 95 bucks an hour. Plumber, let your toilet get clogged up. 120 bucks an hour. Have an electrician come to your house. 150 bucks an hour, right? So you say, how much is your time worth of the master's degree? I mean, that's something to put in perspective. Sometimes we undersell ourselves. You've got a heck of a lot in education. You put a lot of time and money into your education. Don't shortchange yourself, right? And plumbers and electricians, they charge when they leave the house, when they leave the shop. Those buggers. So you say, what is my time worth? What do I charge? Um, I started out at 100 bucks. I've been doing this for 32 years, unfortunately. Um, now I usually get 200 bucks for general consulting. You know, if, if people want me to read stuff and evaluate stuff and uh, you know, expert evaluation of, of stuff, if I have to go do a, a, a deposition, meaning you sit in front of the lawyers and you know, both sides grill you, right? You get puckered pretty tight, I tell you that. So that's 300 bucks an hour. I've never had to been to court. Usually, 95% of the times, court, uh, cases get settled before you go to court. They don't want to go to court, right? They usually settle beforehand. But it's, it's stressful as a dickens. I mean, ask Lance. He's been, he did some of that stuff. He hasn't, he hasn't been to court either uh, or, or been deposed. I've been deposed, I think, four times. And it's, it's stressful as the dickens. Good thing is it takes about 12 hours, so you make a hell of a lot of money. Uh, the other thing is, a lot of times if you're doing a court case, you get a retainer up front and just say, hey, fun before, because you get, in, you get invested. I mean, you get invested emotionally in these things, and you're always thinking about it. So I usually charge a, a minimum of $3,000 retainer. And so for the, first ten, for the first X number of the first X number of hours, go against the retainer, right? And then anything above that, you can start billing again. But it's a minimum of 3000 bucks, three to 5000 depending what I think the market can bear. Um, marketing yourself. This is where you guys are probably better than I am. Um, there's a lot of opportunities out there to market yourself. Um, local newspaper. You figure, most, most newspapers have either a fitness column or a health section, right? Those people are clamped. They're looking for material to write about, right? They want stuff to write about. If you can come up with ideas and contact them, it makes their life easy. We had a guy, Terry Rinflish who was a local reporter for the, the local newspaper. We had something in the paper five or six times a year. I mean, full, play, you know, full page ads on the health thing, on research projects we were doing. And then they learn your name. And if a, product, if, if, some, if a new product comes out or something comes out in the literature, then they call you and get your opinion, right? So you get your name out there. There's always opportunities, opportunities to do stuff on the radio. And usually that stuff would come out of newspaper stuff. Volunteer and leadership positions. Like when I first started, they used to have something called a frigid five road race. Like it basically was uh, usually between Christmas and New Year's. You'd run five miles to Wisconsin, it's cold and heck, so it was frigid, right? I became the race director, right? And then right away you got, you know, 700 people who are in the race know you're the race director and they know your name, right? And then if they have questions or if they've got stu you know, stuff that they want uh, opinions about, they call you, right? The local hospitals see, you know, see who you are, all those kind of things. Social media, I had a flip phone until last April, so I'm not good at this stuff. 
But get your name out there. Post stuff. You, I mean, you guys see it all the time on Facebook, on Instagram, people marketing themselves, right? Get your name out there. Get, get known. You're going to have to volunteer a lot to get your name out there. Don't be afraid to do it. You guys are better at it than we are. Got one more slide, I think. Where the hell is it? Um, the other thing is, no matter what field you're in, like in our field, you need to belong to your professional societies. You have to stay current. Okay, um, this, these are Wisconsin, Wisconsin uh, Cardiopulmonary Re uh, Health and Rehabilitation Association. Okay, when I first started, um, I was a member of Whisper, and one of my professors says, "You know, you need to get involved in the leadership position in Whisper." I mean, our field is cardiac rehab. So you get on the board of directors, next thing you know, I'm vice president, next thing you know, I'm president of the whisper, right? So it's, ni it's nice to be in the know, right? You can't, you, can't you can't sit back and bitch about things and things not being done, right? If you're in a leadership position, you're in control. You, you have a say. You have a seat at the table. Um, AACPR is a national, it's American Association, Cardiovascular and Pulmonary Rehab. I was on their board of directors. I mean, again, as a result of being involved in the state society, I was president of AACVPR in 2002, 2003, right? You're in the know. You know exactly what's going on, right? That benefits your students, right? Because they, they're going to get the most current education, right? When you're sitting at the table writing legislation, meeting with legislatures, meeting with the Congressional Budget Office, you know what's going on. ACSM, same thing. I was on board of directors of ACSM for four years. Um, SEPA is a clinical exercise physiology association. Uh, I had not been involved in leadership of that at all. Okay? But probably the main thing, no matter what field you go into, you have to stay current. Right? My biggest fear is talking to Lance. My biggest fear now is I retired. I, go, you know, I speak around the country five or six times a year, especially on cardiac rehab, exercise physiology, exercise prescription type stuff. You also read five or six journals every month, so you're very current. I just didn't renew my membership to AACPR. I'm going to become irrelevant pretty quick. Nobody's going to want to hear me speak if I don't know what's current, because they want current updates. The other big advantage of being members of these associations, especially in a leadership position, one, you're in the know, two, of the people you get to meet. I mean, I can pick up the phone and call, and these are names you may not know. Uh, I can call Lance. I can call Carl Foster, who was my colleague. I can call Barry Franklin. I can call Ray Squires. I can call the top people in the country as friends, as colleagues, to get advice uh, on anything, pretty much anything you want. Right? Some of my best friends from all over the country, all over the world, are in the leadership positions of these things. So talk about getting your foot in the door, talking about knowing people, talking about creating opportunities for yourself. You know. Uh, the best way to do it, you have to stay, you have to stay current. You have to stay current. And then, just to show you, I think it's my last slide. You can tell it's an old slide, just because my mustache is dark. But <laughs> Thank God for Photoshop. That's all I got. Questions. Questions, questions, questions. Hey! Yes? You talk a lot about, like, The market is not looking good for this field, and like the average exercise physiology salary is about fifty-five thousand a year, which is close to like twenty-six dollars an hour, mm -hmm. and that's a lot. The main path that like a lot of this profession is going down, and this would like jump out of that. But it's like, how do you get like employers' attention when you're not just going to completely undervalue me and look at the Japanese experience? Who else? That was a multi-level question. <laughs> well, no, it's a, no, terrified. no. Terrified of your life. I don't want to go down that road. Well, let me see. Where do I want to start? I always tell my students, you make, you make your own weather. Right? Depends how you view the world, how you view anything. You make your own weather. If you have a, uh, uh, if you have a negative view of things, it's going to be tend toward negativity. Have a positive attitude. I've always said, for our students, we have the best students in the country. We, you know, we put out the best clinical exercise, exercise physiology students in the country. If you're good, there's going to be a job for you. Right? So that's one thing. Be positive. Go to the best school. Get the best education. And create up, say, talk to employers. Talk to people who are in the field. And say, what got you ahead? 
what extra certifications do I need? What extra, you know, what extra, what extra things can I do to make me stand out? The salary thing is, a, is really, I can say, sucks. Mainly because exercise clinical, e doesn't suck that bad. Um, unfortunately, clinical exercise physiologists are not licensed, okay? Which impacts, re impacts how much money you're gonna make, you know? Um, if you're gonna stay in clinical exercise physiology, you're not gonna get rich. I mean, we see a lot of our students, they go out, they might work three to five years. You know, it, it, it really varies. It depends on the individual. Some, I mean, we're in a very people-oriented field. I mean, if you're in clinical exercise physiology working in a cardiac rehab, pulmonary rehab, fitness-type program, it means you love to work with people, right? Are you going to get rich at it? Probably not, in all, in all honesty, because you get, you're going to max out your salary. You know, uh, whereas something like nursing, physical therapy, respiratory therapy where they're, li where they're licensed, right, they have a better salary scale. And because it, it's, reimbur it's reimbursed, there's nothing you can do about that right now. And I don't think we're ever going to get licensed at all. Well, the, the first thing is you've got to get a job. And the higher up you go educationally, the more flexible you have to be to move. Like we get a lot, unfortunately, the way the, we get, the, way the university system is in Wisconsin now, we get a lot of students from Wisconsin. If, someone, if one of our grads wants to get a job back in Madison, Wisconsin, they're going to wait 10 years. If they want a job in South Dakota, Bismarck, North Dakota, I get a job tomorrow. You, you know, because people come to us. So you, the higher up you go educationally, sometimes you have to be flexible and move. Once you get a job, to get involved in leadership positions in these state organizations is very simple. They're always looking for help. They're always looking for people to, volu to volunteer, to be on committees. Once, you be on your, once you're on committees, and show your, and prove yourself, it's very easy to move up. Just as an example, we, we pay for all of our students, we do fundraising every year, we pay for all of our students to go to the Wisconsin State Cardiac Rehab Society, the, the WISP for Concern. We pay, their, uh, we pay their registration, we pay their hotels, we pay their meals, we buy all their pizza and beer. I fill the bathtub with beer, right? <laughs> Last year, there were seven awards given, like uh, Award of Excellence, Presidential Citation Award. There were seven awards given. Every award was won by one of our former students. The president, the president-elect, were our former students. Every single award was won by, won by our students. Why? Because they were exposed to it. They wanted to be involved, and the opportunities are there if you want to be involved. But it's hard, it's hard to get your foot in the door. If you're in different parts of the country, value exercise physiologists differently. You go to, call, you go to California, it's hard to get a job in cardiac rehab as an exercise physiologist because they like nurses, because historically they've always had nurses. You come to Wisconsin, because of our program, Madison used to have a program, many more exercise physiology, the physiology, exercise physiology profession is much more accepted. You know? Okay? Anybody? Yes? Um, does UWL have a PT program? A who? So a PT program? Uh, they have a DPT program, very competitive. Very competitive, as, as everywhere else. But they do have a, a DPT program. Yep. Anything else? Lance, any? Oh, yes. Hi. Sure. Uh, no, 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 no. Sure, absolutely. Yep, yep. And then do what? <laughs> then do what? Well, um, I've never charged. Cause I'm again, literally, we've been in from USA to Playboy magazine, and I've. Um, it, the thing is, you, you don't, you don't have. Unfortunately, you don't have any control of what they write. We were just. You know, everybody's wearing, I, I should sit back for it. Everybody's wearing masks now, right? So we've done three studies on the effect of wearing a face mask, you know, basically wearing a surgical mask versus an N95 on exercise performance. So somehow Sports Illustrated saw our re published research, called me, and they interviewed me about the effect of wearing a mask. It was the most stupid, it was just written pathetically. It was terrible. 
You know, but do I charge to talk to someone 15 to 20 minutes on the phone? No. Oh, yeah. And, and how long, and how long did, and, and it's, it's a phone call. It's 20 minutes to a half an hour. And that, I view it the exact same. Any publicity is good publicity. Uh, I make sure, make sure you send it to your department chair. Make sure you send it to the dean. Make sure you send the copy of that to the chancellor. Uh, it's good PR for the university. And I've never, never, never charged. But it, it's pretty cool. Walking down the street, someone would say, hey, I was reading Prevention Magazine. I saw you quote it. Right? Funny, so we were down. I was on a mission trip with my daughter down in Monterey, Mexico. So I'm working out in the gym, and this guy was this guy's reading the, the muscle head, sitting there reading the thing. He's reading, I can't remember, Muscle and Fitness or something. He says, hey, I'm just reading about these abdominal stimulation devices. And they got this guy quoted from Wisconsin. It was me. <laughs> That's pretty damn cool. Right? Yep. Oh. Sure. I apologize that I've been in and out, so you may have already addressed this, but I'm curious if you have any guidelines or suggestions for communicating to other researchers at other institutions. Um, kind of on an ad needed, I wouldn't, like, sometimes when you're designing, what am I sitting on? <laughs> sometimes when you're designing studies, you'll, you'll reach out. Yeah. Like, usually in this day and age, when somebody publishes a paper, like, if you're designing a study, you read, you, get it, you do a review of the literature, you see who's done what. Uh, you might have a question on methodology or uh, techniques or whatever. Uh, most of the time, they have their contact information right there. You can email them. Most you can just email them. Um, and I found people to be extremely helpful all over the, all over the world and very responsive. You know, so don't be afraid to reach out. I mean, don't be afraid to reach out. And people are generally very, very helpful. They really are. One thing I, I want to mention too about, if you do have the opportunity to work with companies, it's like you, you know that if you're dealing with someone on anything, you want them to be responsive. If you, if you email them, you want to hear back from them, right? You don't want to wait three or four or five days or a week. So when I'm dealing with companies, we're, I'm in constant contact with them. As we're, doing, if we're doing, as we're collecting the data, I might email them once a, once a, uh, a week and just say, hey, We've tested seven subjects, things are going well, da 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 da. You have any questions? But be, re be responsive, reactionary, uh, if I found it been, and I think that's why we've been so successful in having so many opportunities. Because people realize, one, they're going to get a straight shot. I mean, you have to be honest and objective and upfront, right? But they're also know that they can pick up, I tell them, I don't care if you call me, you know, whenever you call me, I'm awake from 7 o'clock in the morning until 10 o'clock at night. Call me anytime you want. If I don't answer, leave me a message, and I'll get back to you. And I think companies appreciate that. Okay. So that being said, you, spoke, you may have already touched on this. You spoke to us for a moment before we started um, about the line that you may or may not cross when a certain company asks you to say something about their product, mm -hmm. and how you navigate that and maintain your integrity. Um, they always, sometimes they'll push the envelope. They'll, the marketing people will push the envelope, right? <laughs> Because they want, they, they're trying to sell product. I'll give you, we talked about an example. I can't remember if we were talking to Lance or you. Um, uh, we did a study for Nordic Track. One group lost, like one, well, the, in, in the one study, the um, Nord, people who worked on the Nordic Track lost 1.2% body fat over 12 weeks. The group that was on the treadmill lost 0.6% body fat, right? Not statistically significant, right? The Nordic track group lost twice as much body fat as the group that walked on a treadmill. Fair enough, right? I told them, I said, you can say that, but you better not put my name with it. If Federal Trade Commission comes to me, I have to be honest. Yeah, they lost 50%, you know, they lost twice as much body fat, but it was not statistically significant. And don't, don't you even think about putting my name on that. So you, you can't, they'll push the envelope, right? But they also realize you dig in your heels because it's, it's the marketing people. They don't know Jack. They don't know anything about physiology, right? But they just want to sell product. So you, sometimes you have to dig in your heels and don't be afraid to dig in your heels, right? Because that's why it says in the contract, you can't, you can't use my name. You can't use the name University of Wisconsin Lacrosse unless I approve it, right? And they, they sent me, Nordic Track actually sent me the graphs, right? And I look at it. Here's the treadmill group. Right, bar graph, okay. right? Here's the, here's the other group. Well, great, the, the, the graph was this big. <laughs> you look at the axis. I mean, you know, you know, if you teach statistics, you know how to lie with statistics. I mean, that's how you right. teach, right? Yeah. 
It's kind of like, wow, if you were to look at that, if you were to look at that, but then you're like, pfft. But so you, you protect yourself contractually, like in the contract up front with the company, you say, you can't, you, you can't say anything with my name on it, on it or the university without written consent. Yeah. But they'll try to push. Lance, anything from you? Oh, we got one over here. Uh huh. Uh, do you present orally or by poster? Okay. I find it one. It's a good experience. I find it's a lot less threatening for students to present posters than it is orally. Because orally, you get up there for 15 minutes, you present your case. At a Midwest ACSM, wherever you're uh, Northland, I can't remember which, which one you said, people are usually a little more forgiving. But you go to national ACSM and you stand up there, some, for some reason people think you put a microphone in front of them, they've got to make you look bad. Right? Whereas if you present a poster, which is easier to do, and people are going to come up and they start reading your poster and you're standing there, but I'm this far away from you, they're not going to crap all over you. They're going to be less likely to crap on you. They're like, ah, yeah, I don't want to look like a fool. And then you can have a nice conversation. They might say in private, well, how come, you know, why did you do this or what did you do here? Whereas when they're standing back in the crowd and you're up on the podium and they're talking at a microphone, now everybody can hear it, right? Whereas if I'm just standing and talking to you right there, I'm going to be much more friendly face to face. To face. So that's more, it's actually more of a learning experience for the students, I think, to present a post. That's my bias. I don't know what you feel, Lance. Yeah, yeah. No, it, it's, a, it's a great opportunity. Put yourself out there. I mean, you get people, at, and most of the time, people are going to ask you valid questions, and you learn to think on your feet, right? And it's less threatening to me to do a poster. We have most of our students do posters.